There is a passage of scripture in Ephesians, fourth chapter, the 13th verse, that we want to give consideration to. The verse in Ephesians 4.13 calls our attention to the fact that God's purpose for us is to reach the measure of the full stature of Christ. Have you ever wondered why it is that you uh, are subjected to the things you're subjected to? Why it is that God brings into your life certain great challenges that you uh, sometimes just fuss and whine about and wonder why in the world does that have to come into your life? There is a reason, my friend, and that is that God's concern is to get you into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He will not compromise that. He will do what is ever necessary, and He will bring into your life whatever is necessary, and God can use many different things. That's called the providence of God, by the way. The providence of God is uh, that God can use anything He wants to, anytime He wants to, any way He wants to, and He knows exactly what to use in order to achieve what needs to be achieved in you and you and me and everybody else. Amen? In His infinite wisdom, God knows exactly what He needed to do to beat old kitchen right here to get Him going. And we've watched God work marvelously in His life. Amen? Amen. Well, you ought to say amen twice about that. (laughs) He could have been that chief that went into that coffee shop and shot them. (laughs) You ever try to do a job and not use the right tool? How many fathers who have had children went to repair a gate or something and they couldn't find a hammer? You know what I'm talking about? I am convinced of this, gentlemen. It's going to find a, it's going to take the judgment seat of Christ to find out where all the hammers went. We won't know till then. I remember one day using a pair of channel locks trying to hammer a nail in the gate because I couldn't find a hammer. I hit my thumb twice, my fingers twice. God knows the right tool to use. Get the job done. He knows. Vincent knows. He's been shaking your bush a long time, huh? Get you where you need to get. He's on the way to Texas, by the way, he and his family. Pray for them. Okay, God has a new adventure for them. Leaving sometime after the first of the month. Pray for them. They've been with us for a while. God sent them here so we could encourage him and his family. And I've watched God work in his life. <clears throat> God will do that. This diagram before us today will help us understand what it is <clears throat> to be conformed to the image of Christ to reach the measure of the full stature of Christ. What is that? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. He is working to produce in you the very things that have to be produced in you so that you will reach full and complete Christ-likeness. He's going to work on that every minute of every day. Seven days a week, okay? For the rest of your life. He will be working in your life, the Holy Spirit, to bring you to this position, to this place, <clears throat> to transform you in scriptural terms, or to be conformed to the image of Christ. This is the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life. <clears throat> Human strength cannot do this. We cannot, by our own energies and our own resources, reach the fullness of the stature of Christ. No matter how hard we try, or no matter how we would labor, that can only be wrought in us by that great ministry and work of the Holy Spirit. Producing in us the very character and nature of Christ Himself. The full stature of Christ produced in our lives by the Holy Spirit will involve 
every dimension of your life and your relationships. Not one thing will be left untouched. When the Holy Spirit cleans the kitchen, He cleans the kitchen. Amen. Amen. He doesn't leave a dirty pot over there or a dirty lid over there or the trash not taken out. No, when the Holy Spirit cleans, it's a total job. And He will do that faithfully, diligently in your life. His work in bringing you into the fullness of the stature of Christ will involve every dimension of your life. Now, we're going to simplify this. Your life revolves around three relationships. That's it. All of your life revolves around three relationships. The first is... Your relationship to God. The second is your relationship to others. What is the great commandment? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your others. <clears throat> and your third relationship is you. Now, your world is wrapped around those three relationships. God, others, and yourself. Now, <clears throat> I don't think you can have any other relationships than those three. Is that true? I mean, that covers it. All of our relationships are within those three realms. The Holy Spirit... And His ministry is to work in your heart and life so that your relationship with God is everything that it should be. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit's work in your life will be bringing you into a proper relationship with everybody else in your life. Amen. Amen. Come on now. Amen. I mean... And the Holy Spirit will work in you personally to get you properly related to yourself. One of the great problems with mankind is he's an enigma. He doesn't even know who he is half the time. He's a mess. If you want to learn how big a mess we are, read the seventh chapter of Romans. Paul says, I'm a mess. I don't know how you interpret that, but that's Arkansas interpretation. <laughs> huh? He said, man, I'm a mess. He said, there are things I want to do, but I don't do them. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Huh? Yeah, there are things I, I know I ought to do, but I don't do them. And then there are things, he said, there are things <clears throat> that I do that I don't want to do. It sounds to me like a mess. Huh? You go on reading about it and, and he talks about it. And he finally comes to a conclusion, does he not? He said, oh, who shall deliver me from this wrecked, wretched man that I am? I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There is deliverance. The Holy Spirit works in your life to get you properly related to God, properly related to others, and properly related to your own self. How does he do that? <clears throat> Turn to Galatians, please. In your Bibles, the book of Galatians, a very familiar passage of Scripture. Fifth chapter. Starting at the 16th verse. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That term walk means lifestyle. You are living in and under the great ministry and influence and empowerment of the Spirit of God. Not once in a while. 
not every now and then. It is the essence of your Christian walk. Walking in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? 17th verse tells you why. There's a battle going on. The flesh wars against the... And the Spirit wars against the... Mm -hmm. So that you cannot do that what you would. That's why Paul said, there are things I want to do, I don't do. Hmm? There's this war going on. And of course you cannot do it in and of your own energy. But there is a power, an empowerment, and a work in the believer that enables him to do works that are beyond his skills, beyond his ability, beyond his strength. Amen. But let's keep reading. 19th verse says, The works of the flesh are clear, manifest. They're shown. You can see them. Everybody can see them. You see them every day. And you probably experience at least one or two of them in your head and in somewhere around you just about every day. Here they are. Adultery. And I would remind you that adultery... It's not necessarily a physical act. It can be of the heart. When somebody else has the affections of your heart that belong to your mate, I don't care if you are not participating in a physical affair, you're guilty of adultery. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like. That's not a complete list. And such like. There could be other things added to it, and some of those you need to uh, research to understand what they are. But all of those terms speak of a wrong relationship with God, of a wrong relationship with others, and of a wrong relationship with ourselves. Every term there is a term that pollutes every relationship you have. You follow me? Some words are big in our scriptures, amen? 22nd words, but! Oh, sometimes those conjunctions are so encouraging, amen? The works of the flesh will always destroy relationships. The works of the flesh will destroy your relationship with God. The works of the flesh will destroy your relationship with others. The works of the flesh will destroy you. You'll be one mixed up mess. But (laughs) the fruit of the Spirit. Oh. Notice singular, not fruits. Fruit. That's important. All that follows is the entire focus of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer. He wants to achieve, and my brother right here, the same thing that he wants to receive, do and achieve in this sister over here. He has a single, single, zealous focus. It is his fruit. Now that fruit is going to be described. There are nine. And we need to see how they apply to this matter of the measure of the full stature of Christ. With me? This is a ten-week sermon. They are sets, three sets of three. Three sets of three. The work of the Holy Spirit, 
wants to get you rightly related to God. In that right relationship with God, three things will be established out of that right relationship with God. Love, joy, and peace. We're going to come back to these. Okay? <clears throat> if you are rightly related to God, these things will be demonstrated in your life. They will be things that you know and experience abundantly. But beyond your relationship with God, your life is made up of relationships with others. The next three are, in relationship to others, the three things are gentleness, gentleness, goodness, do you see them? These describe what? And long-suffering. If you are going to be rightly related to others, the Holy Spirit must produce in you this great fruit. And without it, your relationship with others will never be what God wants it to be. <clears throat> And finally, towards yourself, there are three things. <clears throat> Meekness. What's next? Faith was in there, right? Faith, meekness, and somebody buy me a new tripod for Christmas. <laughs> Faith, meekness, and temperance. If you're going to be rightly related, if you are going to be a person who is whole, these three things must be established in you. Where they are not, you're going to find yourself full of gross distortions. So, the fruit of the Spirit is designed to bring us into proper relationship with God, which is... In proper relationship to others. And regarding ourselves. We will examine those as thoroughly as possible over the next two to three messages. First, if we're going to be rightly related to God, you've got to get in touch with God's love. Do you hear what I said? If you're going to be rightly related to God, you've got to in touch, get in touch with God's love. Now, I'm not talking about reading nice little pamphlets about it. I'm not talking about drawing smiley faces. I'm not even talking about going up to saying somebody and saying God loves you. Brother, I'm talking about getting in touch with God's love. I mean to such a degree that it is a transforming, a transforming matter in our life because we have encountered the love of God. Mankind is desperately, desperately broken. Amen? We are. We are fractured. We're splintered. We're crippled. There's not a person in this room right now <clears throat> that has not been deeply wounded, deeply hurt, deeply offended, deeply betrayed, and there's not a person in here that doesn't have some deep, deep bruises and hurts and wounds down at the very depths of their soul. Amen? Not a one. If you think that you uh, have escaped that, it's simply because you stuck your head in the sand, that's all. If we're ever going to be made whole, we're going to be made whole because we encounter the love of God. And the love of God will heal and produce in us what nothing else can ever produce. I'm talking about the love of God that permeates the mind and the heart and the entire being of a man and woman and they become so conscious of it that it begins to well up within their hearts and lives and it can't be stopped and it can't be contained. A love that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Romans 5, 5. Read it. Come on. Look at it. The work of the Holy Spirit is to do something. Read Romans 5, 5. What does it say? 
that it is the Holy Spirit that what? Sheds the what? The love of God abroad in our hearts. Do you know what that means? It's the Holy Spirit that makes me conscious of God's great love toward me. There was a time when I didn't know that. There was a time when I did not know. And just because somebody wrote me a note and said it, I didn't know it. And I'd heard sermons about it, but I didn't know it. But there came a day when I was 16 years old that I knew that God loved me. And it sunk so deep into my soul and my heart and my life that it transformed me. And it is still at work in my heart and life this hour and this day. The love of God has been shed abroad in my heart and my life. And it's made me a different creation and a different creature. I saw the love of God shed abroad in the heart of my father when I was about five years old. My father up until that time was a man who was violent and angry and vulgar beyond vulgar. And I remember his tender ages sometimes seeing him out of control. I've seen him almost beat a cow or a horse to death in anger because it did not respond like it should. I remember standing on a front porch and seeing him deal with creatures and hearing the violence coming out of him and seeing him <clears throat> as a monster because of the anger pouring out of him. I remember standing back against the walls. It was never directed towards me, thank God. But his anger was so obvious. It was deep-rooted, and I'd, as I became an adult, I found out why. My father had been abandoned four different times in his life. And out of his abandonment, he had deep wounds. But there came a day, I was five years old, I was sitting in the front pew of a church, and I heard about the love of God, and I knew that somehow something was going on in my father. It was close to the end of the service. And the pastor was simply talking about God's great love. And how healing it is in the heart and the life of a person who's old drunk. Amen, preacher? Amen. He can come in and heal a heart. Amen. He can change that that has been there for so long. Amen. My dad started walking down the aisle. He didn't make it to the altar. He was on his knees about the first pew of the church. And I saw him as he surrendered his life. And as he gave his life and as he received the love of God... And I watched for the next 16 years as God worked in his heart and transformed him by one thing and one thing only, the great love of God shed abroad in his heart. I can testify that I experienced the love of a father because the love of God had been shed abroad in his heart from that day at five Till when he uh, went to be with the Lord when I was 18 years old. I never heard my father swear again. I never saw him lose his temple, temper. I never saw him get angry. And I heard him talk many times. Of the love of God. The love of God. I'm talking about if you're going to know God, you're going to have to get in touch with the love of God. Amen. Huh? You're going to have to find out. Now, I found out something. <clears throat> God loves us before we love Him. Amen. 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 That's true. I believe that's what the Word of God says, isn't it, in First John? Huh? Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. And sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. <clears throat> we love Him because He first loved us. Amen. Amen. And that love gets shed abroad in our hearts. And as that love is shed abroad in our hearts, it's transforming. How do you know if the love of God is being established in the heart of a person or not? Because if God is shedding His love abroad in that heart, that person is going to love others. Amen. I mean, it's not that hard, folks. If you really get in touch with the love of God, it's not going to be hard for you to love other people. It will be the most natural thing in the world. It's the fruit of the Spirit producing you the very character of your Heavenly Father. <clears throat> if you're having trouble loving people, <clears throat> it's not God's fault, and it's not your neighbor's fault, and it's nobody else's fault. 
You are not in touch with the love of God. When the love of God captures your heart and captures your whole being and captures your mind and your soul in totality, you are awash in the love of God. Amen. And it is as natural as can be. You don't have to work it up. You don't have to make yourself do it. It flows from the Spirit of God because you are saturated with the love of God. Amen. I mean, it's like breathing. Every minute of every day, you are experiencing God's love, and that love is flowing through you towards others. To be properly related to God, <clears throat> you've got to know his great love towards you. But you also have to love Him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Amen? Amen. It's a two-way relationship. But thank God it grows out of the fact that He loves us first, preacher. Amen, Amen. Paul? Amen. Amen? The Holy Spirit, if you do not know and you have never experienced the love of God, Oh, listen, my friend, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to get you in touch with. God's love. God's love. I suppose because of the society we live in, I told you this is a three-part message. Ten-part, didn't I say? (laughs) Because of the society we've been raised in and because of the limits of men and humanity, probably 60, 70 percent of the people right here did not have the love that they needed growing up as a child. Parents may have been there, but there's a hole in you. Because there's a hole in you, you can't love others. It comes out of your mouth all the time. You talk wicked and evil about people. There's certain people you love and certain people you won't love. When the love of God becomes real to you, it's going to transform your relationships with others. Charles Finney, one of the great, great evangelists of America, had a compassion in him that was beyond human description. What was it that made him such a great evangelist? One thing, the love of God. When he stood to speak, people encountered that love. Not from him. He had been so captured by the love of God himself that it just flowed out of him and he could not, could not help. Listen, that's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. That's what I want for every child of God. Amen? Amen. Here's his testimony in essence. He was an agnostic lawyer, but he fell in love with a wonderful, dedicated Christian young lady. Eventually, he came in great conflict. At first, when he met her, he would ridicule her belief. He would ridicule the church. He would ridicule everything. But God began working in his heart and life, and there came that day and time when he received the Lord Jesus. He wanted to know God. He had a hunger for God. He locked himself away in a little cabin and he said, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start. I'm going to take the word of God. I'm going to lock myself away and I'm going to start reading the word of God. I want to know all I can about God. And he spent days in that cabin just reading the word of God. And his testimony was this. On about the fifth day after he'd been in the word of God, he began to see the love of God in the word, the mercy of God, the greatness of God. The glory of God expressed in his love for mankind. And the more he read, the greater that grew. And he said somewhere in the fifth day, he said the love of God began to rise up over him and in him and bathe him hour after hour after hour. And he said it seemed like it was so great as he became conscious of God's love toward him and that God's heart was a heart of love for men, women like you and I. In that men and women like you and I need to know that love and experience that love, embrace that love, and know it, know it in the depths of our being. He said hour after hour the love of God just washed over him and washed over him. And he said the first time, he said it must have been at least six or seven hours. And I finally said to God, God, I'm going to die if you don't lift your hand. It's just too great. I, I, I can't contain it. It's draining me of all physical strength as I contemplate your love and the greatness of it. It happened three times. Each time, each time, it was more intensive as God showed him his nature and his heart to lift his hand. 
I should have asked God to increase my capacity. I should have asked Him to increase my ability to hold even more of His love. But out of what God had done in His heart and life, perhaps His influence upon our land was greater than any evangelist has ever come out of America. So great was the love of God flowing through Him that while He was speaking in Philadelphia at a big <clears throat> revival meeting had been extended for some six weeks. And the Spirit of God just kept moving and moving as He preached <clears throat> out of the great passion of God's love. One night late, He went out of His <clears throat> dwelling and was walking the streets of Philadelphia and He turned a corner and a prostitute approached Him, positioned Him, propositioned Him, not knowing who He was. He didn't say a word. He just began to weep with compassion because of the great lostness of this woman. The Spirit of God moved in her heart and she was gloriously saved. What had happened? She had just encountered the love of God, that's all. He was invited to speak in New Hampshire. <coughs> he was hosted by a <coughs> very wealthy merchant who had fabric factories. He invited Brother Finney to go visit one of his factories. Took him up to his office. On the office was a balcony out which they could walk and look out on this huge factory. There were about 200 people working in that factory. The man was proud of his work and proud of his product. When Charles Finney stepped out on the balcony and he looked, he saw people who were deeply deeply taken advantage of, improperly paid, working long, hard hours under cruel working conditions. He saw some people who were greatly limited physically having to do jobs that they could not even really adequately perform. And as he looked upon that, the love of God welled up within him. And he stood there and he began to weep with compassion for the great needs of those people. And ere he left, all 200 had become children of God because they had encountered the love of God. If we're going to be rightly related to God. The Holy Spirit must introduce us to that kind of love. Amen? Amen. But not only introduce us to it, he's got to produce it in us. It's his fruit. To create in us the very essence of our Father. God is love. Amen. I suspect the Holy Spirit has been trying to work this into your life for a long time. Amen. The men had an article on their table last night as we were in our meeting. It's kind of an interesting article about a new pastor has been called. And it's a true, it's a true story. To a 10,000 member church. He's going to be introduced this particular Sunday as the new pastor of the church. Now, the elders, the leadership of the church are in on this. They know what's happening. But he has requested, because of the size of the church and the nature of its ministry and things, <clears throat> that he have freedom to do something. So this morning, that Sunday, that he's going to be introduced as the new pastor, he comes into the church as a bum off the street. He looks like he has crawled out of a gutter. I mean, he's a mess. He walks in and he sits down in the front seat of the church. And the ushers come and ask him to politely move to the back. He's just too visible. Out of 10,000 people, three people spoke to him. Before the service, outside, <clears throat> he had asked three people, could you possibly spare a dollar so I could get something to eat? Nobody responded. The service went along as usual. All the announcements, all the things... And then the head elder stood up and said, It is with great privilege today that we will introduce to you our new pastor. Read his name, and from the back of the auditorium stood up the bum and began walking forward. He stood in the pulpit, took the word of God, and read, For I was hungry, and you fed me not. I was naked, and you clothed me not. I was in prison, and you visited me not. The Lord said to them, Lord... And they said to the Lord, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and fed thee not? 
When did we see you naked and fed thee? He said, not clothe you. And when were you in prison and we never came to minister to you? As he is reading the scripture, hearts are breaking all across the congregation. Tears are beginning to be shed. Truth is being applied to the heart. It's not enough to talk about the love of God. We're to demonstrate it. Amen? Amen. It's to flow from us continually, perpetually. That's what I want in my life, in my heart. And that's what I want for you. And that's what I want for this church in us. And I say amen to that. Amen. Let's sing our altar call this morning. If you need to come to the altar for any reason, it is open. Should you need to come to say, God, teach me all about your love. Shed it abroad in my heart and my life. Transform me and change me. Are you here today? The Spirit of God is drawing you into the love of God for the first time. You're hearing that God loves you, and it's not just hearing, but you're knowing it. And you would come to Him today that you might become His child. We invite you to come. I'll ask the worship team to come and join us as we sing this together. Pay attention to the words closely. I want us to be a congregation that demonstrates the love of God, not talk about it. Amen?